Romans 14, 13 to 23 in ESV. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling blocks or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know, and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbringing. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Last week in verses 1 through 12, we learned that Paul stated that we are absolutely free to decide for ourselves on those really important modern church issues, like if we should eat bacon or not, or if we should celebrate certain feasts and days, you know, really things that the church really struggles with today in in our context and divides churches around us, you know. Um, No, actually, that's not quite true. We're actually confronted with the idea that we need to be gracious to other people who have different convictions about non-essential items, things like entertainment, education choices for our children, what we do with wealth, and COVID masks, which apparently we didn't have much time to cover last week, and ironically, we don't have much time to cover this week either. Actually, Paul's main point in the passage is that we are to accept one another and not judge one another or look with contempt on those who differ with us over non-essential issues. He was talking mainly last week about people that he described as weak in faith, and that was in 14 verse 1. And these weaker believers are not weak in the sense of not being able to resist temptation. That kind of weakness is called sin. Rather, they were weak in the way that they were trying to figure out how to deal with the Old Testament and the laws in the Old Testament, and they felt as if they were still bound in some ways to observe the things in the Old Testament as well. Don't forget, guys, that Christianity had a significantly Jewish background, which at this point had already had millennia of history behind it, and it's hard to change that overnight. People don't like change. In a book by Alan Deutschman called Change or Die, he did a study that found that one of nine people will make lifestyle choices after they are told that they could prolong their lives or restore their health, even reverse diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease if they would exercise once or twice a week and maybe change the way they eat a little bit. So did you hear me? Only 11% of people choose life over death is what he's saying in that moment. Even a cursory research for me in studies that I saw on the internet this week showed me that between 60 and 80% of people do not like change and stick to patterns no matter what. I mean, they won't move, they won't change jobs, they won't get out of a relationship because the unknowns of that change. Now, I'm an early adopter and I like change, so I don't quite get it, but it seems accurate. I lived in Chicago for three years, for example, and I realized three years into that that no one left Chicago because they didn't like change. Because every day in Chicago, the weather threatens to kill you. And like, I was like, do you know there's other places in the world you can move to, right? You don't have to live in Chicago. My apologies for those of you who are in Chicago. Someone booed me for service. So. So you can just imagine that people would have had this experience when they were told that Christians no longer hold to all the stipulations of the Jewish law and that these things were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, Now we can imagine the Gentiles probably didn't have as much of a problem with it since they weren't really changes for them, but the Jewish brothers and sisters were understandably struggling. 
And so it created some different types of people in the early church that Paul actually labels for us to understand. For example, I already mentioned to you the weaker brothers. Well, he starts this week with the stronger brothers. And Paul says that he's one of them in chapter 15, verse 1. And these stronger brothers and sisters realized or knew that they were not under the requirements in the Mosaic Law. That was one category of people. And secondly, there were the weaker brothers and sisters who were still trying to figure out what to observe, what not to do, what to let go of, and all of those things. And unfortunately, because of human nature, the tendency for the early church was to look with contempt on the other side, those who held something different than they did. Uh, man, it's, it's such a good thing that we are more mature in our modern church and world than they were in the early church, right? You know, now that we've moved beyond that. Now, you might say to me, okay, I get that, but let's be honest here. Who was right? Like, tell me, wasn't one side right? I mean, the context of this entire thing has to be Acts chapter 10 and 11, where God told the apostle Peter that all foods were clean and that all people were clean, and so that he should not call something unclean if God had declared them or it clean. Now, we don't have time to read it, but later on you could read Acts 10 and 11 and hear that story where Peter had this amazing realization of what the Spirit of God did to create one family out of all the people of earth. And Peter, in that same moment, learned that all foods were clean for believers as well. And it's not just Peter, friends. It's actually Jesus, too. In Mark chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, I had to cut this out because of time, but Jesus is talking to some followers, and he tells them some incredible news. And I'll just point out the highlights. You can see it highlighted behind me where he says this, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but it's the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And then the gospel writer, Mark, gives us little parentheses to tell us what Jesus was saying. He said, he declared in this way all foods to be clean. So Jesus, as well, agrees with Peter. The, the observance of eating the right food didn't make you clean, and abstaining didn't make you defiled. So clearly one side was right, right? I mean, think about this. The Peter, Jesus, and apparently Paul side was right, but not so fast, because we I've learned something in my life and ministry, and that's this. You can be right, but be entirely wrong at the same time. Have you learned this? This is a good life lesson to know, not just in the context of your own life, but in church as well. You can be right, but you can be entirely wrong at the same time. This is a life axiom that we would do well to remember. And even though in the early church one side was technically right, they were running into problems for how they treated other people, and therefore they were actually wrong. And this is what was happening at the beginning of Romans chapter 14. So Paul tells the Christians, tells all believers there, to allow people to follow their own consciences and not judge others because every person will give an account to God and God alone for the way they live their lives. And not a single one of us in here or in the world will be asked by God to judge our brother and sister on what, if they did the right thing or not. And I know that's unfortunate. Some of you are like, dang it, I've been waiting for that day all of my life to tell God who was right and who was wrong. But this is the recap of the first 12 verses of Romans 14, which are needed to get to the main point of Romans 14, 13 through 23 today. Because after this introductory summary that goes out to both sides to not judge one another, to recap Romans 14, to be sort of the heading for the rest of the chapter, Paul now turns to what he calls the stronger believers instead of the weaker ones. And he was concerned that these stronger believers would flaunt their liberty in Christ to the detriment of others who might be influenced to join in to those liberties that they were observing and thereby violate their own consciences. This is all because in Romans 14, 13 through 23, Paul presents a really important part of Christian liberty, and it's this. Those who are free to enjoy their liberty are even more responsible for not having an adverse effect on other believers. I have it written down. I, I sometimes wonder if these are helpful or not up here, and I have them because I know some of us are visual learners. But think about it once again with me. Those who are free to enjoy their liberty are even more responsible for not having an adverse effect on other believers. So taken as one whole argument, Paul continues his teaching on how the stronger and weaker brothers and sisters within the local church are to interact with each other and encourage one another in their perseverance of the faith. And to the weaker, to be clear here, never condemn the one who exercises their freedom in Christ. To the weaker one, don't condemn those who are stronger. And to the stronger, never push your weaker brother or sister in such a way that it leads to their destruction. This is the big argument of Romans 14. Now, 
Even though we are not as concerned in our day and age about the spiritual implications of eating or not eating pork products or food sacrificed to idols in this particular context, uh, which is the main issue that Paul was, of course, addressing. And I understand that Paul also addresses uh, observing certain holy days in 14 verse 5 and drinking wine, which is in 14 verse 22, which may be a little bit more relevant in our day and age. I still think this passage has particular relevance to the church of Jesus Christ. And hear me, even imprint church. I feel like this is a word for us as a church. If we are to build this church as one family under God. Why would I say that? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. The first one is this. I think some people wrongly believe that holiness and sanctification is in competition or even a contradiction to freedom in Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to say that again because I don't feel like it's totally clear unless you hear it. I think some people wrongly believe that holiness and sanctification, the pursuit of holiness and sanctification, is in competition or even a contradiction to freedom in Jesus Christ. This, friends, is a significant mistake. For Christian freedom is not, hear me, not freedom to sin, and the pursuit of holiness is not a contradiction to the freedom that Christ brings to certain Christians. Christian freedom is not the freedom to not care about sin anymore. In fact, it's the opposite. Christian freedom is not saying I don't care about being Christ-like anymore. Christian freedom is rather knowing we have a relationship with God that is based only on what Jesus has done for us to give us salvation from sin and to help us also in our ongoing fight against sin in our world and in our lives. And salvation, friends, is amazingly comprehensive. It's beautiful. I mean, the picture of salvation in the Bible is bigger than we can ever imagine. For it includes both, well, it includes three things, I think, really. Justification by faith is the first, which is the moment you are saved from the penalty of sin. When you surrender your life to Jesus and say, I trust you for my salvation, I repent of my sins, and I turn to you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And when you do that, you are justified by faith. In other words, you're saved from the penalty of sin, which is death. That's part of salvation. Another part of salvation is sanctification by faith as well which is helping us walk down a road to overcome the power of sin in our lives. To say as a Christian that you are fighting sin, you are struggling against sin, that is so easy to fall under sin and temptation in our lives. But being a Christian is saying sanctification by faith is believing that the Holy Spirit is working within you to help you desire to not sin and to fight the fight of faith. But it also includes one more thing. It includes glorification by faith. The hope that we as Christians will have, that not only that we're being sanctified, that we are ridding our lives of the presence of sin, but that one day we will be completely free from the presence of sin, which is brilliant news. I mean, the fact that we can be justified, sanctified, and glorified, that we know this is a trajectory that God has us along, that one day when he comes again, when we see him, our faith is sight, and sin is no longer in your life. That is amazing. Friends, that's true true freedom. That's as free as we get. But freedom in Christ doesn't mean we jettison any part of the process of salvation at all. And over and over again, it's emphasized for us in Scripture to obey the Lord, to pursue holiness in the Spirit's power. So it's not a contradiction to uh, any kind of holiness or desire for sanctification in your life because that's part of your salvation. But this also makes me think of a second reason why it's hard for us to understand and why I think it's important for us to apply this text to our lives today, and that's this. Some people have wrongly used this text to create unbiblical and maybe even unspoken rules for other believers that go above and beyond what was written in the Bible. All right, one more time, just so you're following me. Some have wrongly used this text to create unbiblical and maybe even unspoken rules for other believers that go above and beyond what was written in the Bible. And I think this is because of the part of Romans 14, 13 that says this, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. All right, we have to pause here for a second, especially if you're part of the church culture and you've been part of the church culture for a while. The words stumbling block have some history, do do they not? How many of you, if you're church people, don't have to raise your hand or anything, but have heard this term before or maybe even have some reaction to this term in your heart or mind? 
There are some examples we could think of. We could talk about many of them. But I want to use one that hits home for some of us as we think about what we've known as stumbling block as in the past. And I want to help you think what stumbling block, what Paul is actually getting to here. And what's this? Here's my example. Think of what some women in the church and our Christian subculture have been told throughout the years, which is probably born of good intentions. Believe you, not, believe you me, I, I understand it's born of good intentions, but the implications of it can be super alarming. It goes something like this. As a Christian woman, you can't dress that way. You must wear a certain type of clothing, and if you don't, you're causing me to stumble. You've heard this before. If you're part of the Christian subculture, you've certainly heard this. Now, to me, this has caused a culture of guilt, shame, and in my opinion, an unbiblical view of manhood and womanhood, which is a whole other sermon entirely, honestly. But don't get me wrong. I understand this could be a wisdom issue as well and could be addressed well in the context of good discipleship relationships, but not necessarily as a rule that the Christian subculture has to fall under. Now, it's a hard one, right? It's tough to think about what that actually means, but it's something we need to reckon with as we think about what Paul is saying. And I would give you a different way to think of the idea of stumbling block, because I believe we use the term stumbling block and hindrance here in very subjective ways. We think of it in ways of things like I'm personally offended by, or things that don't fit my paradigm, or my culture, or things that don't fit my preference. These things are hard for us to understand and pull them out of the realm of moral value. But they have a greater meaning, I think, of what Paul is doing here for us to understand within the context of what he's writing. And if these words simply mean what angers me or what bothers me or what upsets me or what causes me to look bad or feel bad about myself, then these verses have been used in the past to control other people and their behavior. And can't we all agree that is a huge problem? Red flags just go up all the time. Now, you might say then, what do these verses mean? What what does it actually mean? A stumbling block. What does it mean to never be a hindrance or a stumbling block to another believer? Well, I think in that way, we have to go back to what is king, queen, and prime minister of the text. You know what that is? Context. The context. Think about what Paul is doing here. Just what we heard read from Carissa earlier should make it super clear to you. In verse 13, Paul uses the word stumbling block and hindrance, which we just looked at. In verse 15, he talks about the things that grieve or destroy another. In verse 15, he mentions to not destroy another, which is an entirely different Greek word than the first destroy, by the way. And then there's the word stumble there as well. And then finally, in verse 23, he has the word condemned. These all build upon each other, and they create this picture of what a stumbling block really is. And they shed light for us on what I think Paul is trying to do. And if we take all of these ideas together, I think about what's happening here is Paul is saying to us as the church to never do something that would cause someone to miss the gospel and fall away. That's what I think a stumbling block is. Something that causes another person to miss the hope of the gospel and fall away. A stumbling block is not just something you don't like or something you were told is real or something that just fits your cultural norm, if you will, or something that doesn't make your community look bad or even sometimes, or is defined as temptation. Paul is telling believers that each person will stand before God, and it's actually something that nullifies the truth of the gospel by adding or taking away something for it, or something to it, and thereby destroying that work of God, as he says in verse 20. And Paul says that can lead to the ultimate condemnation of other people, and that's where it gets really intense. This is weighty. These are big words and strong words for us to understand. For if we go beyond the Bible to legislate morality, we're not helping people understand the gospel. We're creating roadblocks to the gospel, in fact. So we will do well to show concern about this passage. Let us not create those external rules that cause the destruction for other Christians that are not based on Scripture. Now, as we wrestle with this a little bit in the context of this passage, uh, let me illustrate this a little further for you to understand what I'm saying. Have you ever noticed how often it happens that tradition becomes a value And then when a value is upheld for long enough, it eventually becomes an ethic. Think about this. And again, I want to illustrate this to make it super clear. I had a professor named Doug Moo at Wheaton College Graduate School years ago, and he wrote literally the commentary on the Book of Romans. So if you want a commentary, he's got the thousand pager. It's like the one he wrote. And I remember him talking about this passage in Romans 14 one day in class, which he wrote about in another commentary, because evidently a thousand pages wasn't enough or something like that, where he tells a story to illustrate this point. And he says this, 
He knew a family where on Easter Sunday, the famous ham that they had prepared always had an inch or so sliced off from one side of it before it was put in the oven. All right? This had gone on for years. Now, eventually, someone got around to asking the family about why this was done. And in this particular moment, the woman who was cooking the ham replied, well, I guess it's because my mother always did it that way. So with her interest stimulated at that moment, she in turn found her mother, who was at the Easter party, and asked her mom why she cut that chunk off the ham. Her mother replied, well, because my mother always prepared it that way. So the lady then turned to great-grandma, who was also with the family, to talk about it and asked the question about why the inch or so of ham was cut off the side. And great-grandma had a look of confusion for a moment and then suddenly laughed out loud and explained, well, dears, the oven in our first home was so small that the whole ham would not actually fit in it. So I had to chop off half the inch of ham for it to fit inside it. A tradition became a value. A value became an ethic, ethic, and it's now just what they did. Does that make sense? This just happens. If you don't believe me about this happening, I know you place a moral value in here on how someone does the toothpaste in the bathroom. Like if you squeeze it like a, like a, like a crazy person or if you roll it up from the end. Oh, wait, I just put a moral value on that, I think. Or, or you also have a moral value on which way you put the toilet paper, like over the top or over the back, like a savage. Oh, sorry, I'm still getting caught in this. Or if you go to a guest house and you like leave the toilet up or leave the toilet lid down at the guest's house, you don't do that at your own house, but you do it at the guest's house for some reason, I don't know why. You all have strong emotions like this. You have a value in this. And I haven't even left the bathroom yet, right? You've created something in the context of your own life that has become tradition, value, and ethic. And I think this becomes problematic in the kingdom and the things that we give moral value to. And I think Paul wants us to understand the complexity of the kingdom of God and the way we view the freedom that we give to one another. Because sometimes we create things that are moral that are not supposed to be. And that is a huge theme of Romans 14. In fact, I want to give you what I think is the thesis of Romans 13, excuse me, 14 verses 13 through 20, 23 to help you understand in the remaining time I have left, I'm just going to walk through this phrase because I think Paul is saying something here that is so important for our church to grasp. And the order may be different than you expect, but without further ado, here's what I think Paul is saying. Kingdom diversity should inform our kingdom values and help us live out our kingdom ethics. This is what I think Paul's doing here. Kingdom diversity should inform our kingdom values and help us live out our kingdom ethics. This is different than the order that I would normally think of but I was trying to submit myself to what Paul was saying this week in Romans chapter 14. I would normally think our values would go first or our ethic would go first. But Paul's saying actually the diversity of the kingdom needs to actually build some value and ethic into your church community. So let's walk through this. Let's see if you see what I mean. And we'll start with kingdom diversity. Check this out. Romans 14, 14. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Weirdest verse in the Bible, right? Paul's like, I have opinions about this. I am right about this. But it, it may not be right. That's what he says. That's what he's saying right here. Romans 14, 14 leads to the shocking truth about kingdom diversity. That some things are right for you that are wrong for others. And some things are wrong for you that are right for others. That's weird, man, in the context of the church. Like, we like black and white rules, make it so easy for me to understand, create paradigms for us just to get, and then we can advance knowing that we're always right or we're always wrong or something like that. And, and if we see our brother or sister doing something that we feel like is not in that category, we, we can call them out on it. But Paul's saying something different here. He says, sometimes things are a matter of a person's conscience. Again, friends, don't get me wrong. Like Tom said last week, this is not about essential doctrines or clear moral issues in the Bible that are either callings or prohibitions in Scripture, all right? Those are not the things we're talking about here. Those are clear, and we don't have Christian freedom to sin. I should say that 10 times so you think I'm not lying. We don't have Christian freedom to sin. It's the other things that we would consider freedoms. What you might consider some Christian freedoms in your life or things maybe in our culture. That's awesome. Get to dance up here. I remember Javon Washington did that once, started freaking out. He started dancing on the front. I was like, yeah, it's awesome. Let me see if I can get below the surface a little bit to help you understand. And just mentioning a couple of these things. And I'm not lobbying for any of these things at all. I'm just trying to help you understand a few of the things that I can think of when we think of things that may be connected to conscience. All right? Are you ready? I'm shaking a little bit. I'll be okay. All right? 
alcohol, tobacco products, yoga, <laughs> dancing, types of clothing you wear, owning a gun or not, making your body a canvas for piercings and tattoos, taking personality tests like the Enneagram or your view on governance. Are you uncomfortable? You have strong opinions about these things, and your neighbor does too. Like literally the person sitting right next to you <laughs> has like opinions about these things. And newsflash, these are not crystal clear in scripture. They require wisdom, they require self-assessment, they require care, they require the community of Christ around you, and most importantly to Paul, it requires a clean conscience in doing these things. And you will find, ironically, that your conclusions about these things will sometimes differ from other people in the context of the local church. Not all believers have the same freedoms about non-essential issues. And especially when we make non-essential issues essential issues, it can create division and problems. And moreover, we even violate the scripture which says both these things. Check this out. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died, on one hand. And two, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. He just contrasted himself in this very same verse. It's just incredible. This is a serious tension. And we as Christians need to be willing to not pass judgment on one another, as Romans 14.1 1, 14, 1 says, and converse respectfully about these differences. Can you have strong feelings if another Christian can do yoga or buy a 10,000 square foot house? Let me just say it this way. It's incredibly hard not to, all right? You have opinions. You feel them deeply. God has laid it on your conscience to live a life a certain way. And you place that upon other people, willingly or unwillingly. And it is hard to break that pattern. But here's my point. The feelings that you are supposed to have to rein in your own motives and your conscience are to not act as someone else's motives or conscience, right? Right? You have your own feelings and strong feelings about these things because the Spirit of God is living in you, speaking in you, and telling you the things you ought or not ought or not ought to do or shouldn't do. That's the word I'm looking for. And you can't place those things on someone else, especially about debatable things. Now, on the other side of this, if you really believe in kingdom adversity, it also means something different. It means that we regularly question the motives for what we do out of a couple reasons. One, out of love for other believers, and two, as Paul says, belief that Christ died on the cross for them as well. This is Romans 14.5. That's his basis for the whole thing, that we love other people and we believe that Christ died for all people. So believers ought to love one another and believers ought to be compelled by the sake that Jesus died on the cross to place us on a level ground as people. You see, friends, kingdom diversity is not only for our ethnic beauty of a multicultural kingdom of God, which it absolutely is, it's also made up of people who have different convictions about things that are not shared by everyone. And when we begin to appreciate that a little bit and not just say, I, I guess what you're doing okay is okay, but a real Christian really wouldn't do that, we're not understanding Romans 14. Because Romans 14 says we have something else as Christians. In the same vein, when Paul says that we can destroy the one for whom Christ died, we have to start asking ourselves some really serious questions. Questions like, are we forcing other people to absorb what I think is right for me? Are we placing peer pressure on someone else in some way to make them violate their conscience or even worse, to reject the hope of the gospel, even if it's permissible? Verse 23 tells us that a person is condemned when he or she eats while harboring doubts whether it's right or wrong. And that's a problem, a huge problem, a huge problem in the church. And if that is happening, Paul says your good will always be spoken of as evil because it has driven people from the faith. So don't make your good always be someone else's good. That's not what Paul is saying here, here either. And you know what's crazy to me? Paul certainly has this opinion about what is right and wrong, as I've said before. By now we understand this passage has a, a background of unclean food. But in verse 20, he affirms that everything is clean. So according to biblical law, it's okay to eat anything at all. And then Paul gets even more specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and following about this. And I wish we had time to read it. We just don't. You can read it later on. But in this, he's saying that believers are free to go ahead and eat that impossible burger and add bacon on top of it. I don't know why you do that, but you actually can do that, you know. Yet Paul also limits his freedom and wants us to limit his freedom, because, our freedom, because of kingdom diversity. 
Now, how does he tell us to do this? Pay attention here because it's really important. Christian liberty should be limited by our love and by other people's consciences. This is how it should be limited. I think more people want to know the answer of the question of how do I balance Christian liberty in my love? Well, let me just say it this way. I think that's the wrong question, friend, because you literally can't balance it. You can always and should always lean towards love. Hear me super clearly here. Love for one another is always greater than your freedom. Always. Every day of the week and twice on Sundays. This is so important for us to understand. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Romans 14, 15. Clear contradiction to the opposite, in the opposite of Romans chapter 12, where he says, let love be genuine. This is the picture of what Christian community is. Giving up your freedom and rights for the kingdom diversity is so Christ-like. And this is Philippians chapter 2. This is the picture of what Christ has done, where he says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others, like Jesus did. This is the picture of what we are to do. So we live in this tension, friends, of kingdom diversity, where in the non-essentials, we can have a lot of freedom, but with that freedom comes a lot of responsibility. I sound like I'm an Uncle Ben from Spider-Man or something there, right? I mean, even the fact that in this passage where he's emphasizing Christian freedom, he constantly does it in reference to other believers in Christ. You always got to think about your freedom in terms of someone else. Always place yourself and not just flaunt your freedom as much as you want to. Think about how you may destroy someone's belief in the gospel if you flaunt your freedom that way. I think that's why kingdom adversity starts there, starts at the beginning. And it doesn't make sense to me, but Paul says that kingdom adversity actually leads to kingdom values and it informs our kingdom values. And again, wrestle with this order with me. I, I think it's brilliant. I'm pretty sure that most Christians get so righteously minded when we read this passage. And it's because, friends, I do. And I think you're a lot like me. For some reason, I typically want people to know about my freedom in Christ. I don't know why. I just do. I want people to know I'm mature or something like that. Or maybe there's some weird twisted sense of me that I want to teach some Christian about the real way to be a Christian, you know, as if my way is the best way, right? And I, I think I can flaunt my freedom and show you how good I am and all this kind of stuff, literally not thinking about how it affects my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so what Paul does, he says, man, that is not the most important thing for you to flaunt your freedom. The most important thing is the values that you should have knowing about the diversity within the context of the kingdom of God and to value the things that are kingdom things and not just conscience things. That's why I think in Romans 14, 17, he says, for the kingdom of God is a matter, excuse me, not a matter of eating and drinking or the things that are a matter of non-essentials, if you will, if you don't think of it that way, but what? of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Of the fruit of the Spirit is the most important things. The, the real issue is going past the eating and drinking or abstaining from those things. The real issue is the kingdom stuff, the, the values of righteousness, peace, joy, and walking in love with one another. So rather than pursuing freedom and Christian liberty at all costs, by de-emphasizing God's values or adding to his words at the cost of someone else's faith, we are called to pursue, pursue the greater things. To help our brothers, in other words, and sisters, we must at times allow for personal freedoms. You must allow that. But sometimes you must restrain from personal freedoms because their soul is more important than your liberty. And that's something that hits deep within the context of our church community. When we start to understand our choices affect the other people in our congregation, it's when things start to turn on in our minds of how we ought to live the Christian life. Not just defining it by what we think is correct or not correct based on non-essential things, but rather basing it on what you think about what God has done for your neighbor in Christ. God died through Jesus Christ, died on the cross for that person, and I ought to love them as well. So Paul says in this concluding phrase in Romans 14, 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. I love this. Go nerdy for just a second with me. Mutual upbuilding is an interesting phrase, but it's a way better image. And I think this image will help us understand kingdom values a little more. Some Bibles out there, maybe you have an NIV in front of you. It says edification here, I think. But I think it's deeper than that. Edification is a, a good Christian word. But I, I think the image is so beautiful. It's the word oikodome, all right? That's a good Greek word for you today. And it's the same word that's used for building a house, a construction project, if you will. And we know something about building a house. That is, it takes mutual work to get her done, right? Like I, in college, I, I had a year where I spent framing houses in the summer and made a lot of money and a lot of mistakes while I was framing houses. 
And I learned something really important, and that is if you're a framer, and you don't keep in the mind that the fact the electrician is going to come in after you and work on the house that you have been framing and will be extremely mad at you if you do things wrong in the framing of it. You're not building a house together. You're just getting the job done. This is what I learned, right? Because the electricians come along and said, what is going on? This is a huge mess. Are you an idiot? And I'm like, yes, I'm new at this. I am kind of an idiot, if you will. But here's the kingdom value. Working together, building up something as one people, knowing that someone else is going to come along later and has a job to do as well, and they also need to work on their thing. I looked this word up, oikodome, in the, in the Greek New Testament to see places it was used. It's awesome. Man, check this out. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Oh, excuse me, 14, 12. In the context of spiritual gifts, Paul writes, strive to excel in the oikodome of the church, in the building up of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, later on. When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for the oikodome, building up, for the building up. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear, for the building, for the oikodome, for building up of the body. And maybe, friends, most importantly, I think, is Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul writes about the glorious bringing together of people from all kinds of backgrounds and economic statuses and ethnicities together to build the body of Christ in Ephesians chapter 2. And he writes this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built, which is actually the word epikoidomeo, which is the word to kind of say, I'm actually building this right now on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, the oikodome, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together, soon oikodomeo, into a dwelling place by God, by his Spirit. Three times in this phrase, he uses the same imagery for us to understand that the church is a building project that we work on together in a value that we have to build it up together by knowing that this is our calling. Not just to prove each other right and wrong on the things that we think are right and wrong, but rather to allow there to be a home of diversity that's being built and that you're trusting other people who are coming behind you to build onto the house as well. This is the picture we have, the mutual upbuilding of the house of God. Because see, kingdom values lead us to kingdom diversity. And if we understand that, that's what builds into our ethics as a church community, kingdom ethics. And again, the order blows my mind, but I think it's still important. Where Paul says in Romans 14, 20, and 21, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Pretty down to earth there, if you're asking me. Pretty ethical. And in my mind, a good word for us to not flaunt our freedom, to be careful around other people. As the saying goes, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something, you know? This is the picture of what it means to be the church. And as long as we absorb these kingdom diversity and kingdom values, your ethics become an important part to build as being part of the church of God, this beautiful housing project that God is building through each one of us. No wonder he tells us in Romans 14, 22, the faith that you have, you keep between yourself and God, Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. You've built into your life an ethic that is, ironically, in this passage, between you and God. Not between you and everyone who listened to you on Facebook to rail on the thing that is most important to you, but between you and God. This is what it is. This is how you absorb kingdom diversity and kingdom values into a kingdom ethic. In fact, Paul goes on to even say in Romans 14, 23, whoever, excuse me, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats those foods because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. See, your ethics are personal. You don't have to, in, in some ways, come up with ethics just because your brother or sister are doing that thing. There's something personal in you that is God building in you a, a, a way of living about those non-essential things. It is so important, and you are going to have emotions about, and you're going to feel strongly about those things. But in that is beauty. If you can live that in the context of the local church and hold on to that with, with steadfastness, you can be part of the amazing building that God is building. We've covered a lot today. And my prayer is that I've helped you create kind of a paradigm for freedom in Christ and how to consider yourself as part of the kingdom of God. They tell you in homiletics classes that you take in seminary that your intro and conclusion are the most important parts of your sermon. 
Well, today my intro wasn't catchy, and I literally still don't know how to end this sermon. As Tom Regan says, I am crashing the plane right now is what I'm doing. So let me just end with the thesis, the paradigm that I gave you, that I hope you've seen in this text, and I hope I've proven for the sake of Christ's church and for unity. Kingdom diversity should inform our kingdom values and help us live out our kingdom ethics. Lord, help us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I'm super compelled by Romans 14. It was helpful to me this week to reflect upon the things that you're calling me to personally, the things that I sometimes unwillingly place on other people that are not scriptural, but I find to be most important, and how often I try to flaunt my own freedom before people to show people I'm like mature or something, which is just ridiculous. And Lord, I pray just as this week, as this passage spoke to my heart and mind, I pray it did the same for my brothers and sisters in here. And that we would do everything we can to see how you're building a diverse group of people up into the church, Lord, that values that diversity. And out of that comes the ethics that you give to us, Lord, that we should and ought to live as you call us to by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that's a beautiful picture of the church. It means that we're not all the same. It means that the kingdom of God is greater than just the American culture. It's, it's bigger, it's, it's larger. It, it goes to worldwide things that value different things than we do in our particular Western culture mindset. It, it means so much. But I pray it would build the church of Jesus Christ right here in Woodenville, in Bothell, and on the east side of Seattle, Lord, and help us to be a community of Christ for the world, Lord, we pray. Thank you for this time. We commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.